Construction continues in a portion of I-64 this weekend in downtown St. Louis. Detours are in place for drivers heading across the river in both directions. News 4's Caroline Hecker joins us now live this morning along I-64. Caroline, when will all of this be done? Well, Justin, hopefully the answer is tomorrow morning. Caroline, we're hoping they can get all of that done. Thanks so much for that live report. And it was a violent Friday night in downtown St. Louis. Police say one man was shot and injured in a parking lot near Bush Stadium. And that wasn't the only incident. News 4's Bl Vinton Blandon talked to one resident who says he's fed up with the violence. And breaking overnight, multiple people shot in separate shootings and at least one person dead. The homicide was on Minnesota just after midnight on the south side. Authorities say the man died on scene. No word on any suspects. And protesters calling for justice after a young man was shot and killed at a local McDonald's. 19-year-old Sequoia Whitfield died Wednesday morning at the McDonald's on Tucker, just north of downtown St. Louis. Friends tell News 4 he worked at the restaurant for about four years. We just want to know if anybody know anything, just just go to the police or, you know, just tell the family or something, you know, don't leave them in the shadows and let them be heartbroken because they don't know who killed their son. Protesters say they want the McDonald's to close for a few days to show respect for Whitfield. St. Louis police are asking anyone with information on this case to call Crime Stoppers. Now to the latest on the coronavirus numbers in the St. Louis area. Yesterday, the pandemic task force reported a decrease in the number of hospitalized patients in the last 24 hours. There are currently 271 people hospitalized in the St. Louis area. That's 20 fewer than Friday. Over the last week, the number of hospitalized patients held steady at about 275. Across the state of Missouri, health officials reported more than 1,100 new COVID cases yesterday. That includes 276 new cases in St. Louis County. The state also reports 10 additional deaths. Missouri now has more than 66,000 cases and more than 1,300 deaths. In Illinois, the total number of COVID cases is over 200,000. The state reported more than 1,800 new cases yesterday and five deaths. You can take a closer look at all of these numbers on both sides of the river right there in our KMOV News app. And the federal watchdog overseeing the U.S. Postal Service opened an inquiry ahead of the November election. Operational changes at the post office have delayed mail deliveries in some parts of the country. This, as President Trump has refused efforts to increase funding for the Postal Service to deal with mail-in ballots. Weijia Jiang is following the latest developments. This morning, House Democrats are considering a return to Washington next week to address issues related to the U.S. Postal Service. Possible legislation could forbid sorting device changes, prevent facility closures, protect overtime pay, and maintain delivery schedules. Even if the House passes such measures, they'll likely stall in the Republican-controlled Senate. U.S. Postal Service officials says Missourians who are using mail-in ballots need to return them at least a week before the November 3rd general election. That way, you can ensure your vote will be counted. This means you should send your ballot no later than October 27th. Election officials expect a big increase in mail-in ballots this year because of the pandemic, so you want to get those in on time. Again, the date to remember here is October 27th for Missourians. And the St. Louis Cardinals returned to the field in a big way yesterday. The Redbirds swept a doubleheader against the White Sox in Chicago. Yesterday was the first time the team played in more than two weeks because of the COVID-19 outbreak among staffers and players. Coming up right here on News 4 this morning, hear how Illinois politicians are remembering the late governor, James Thompson. And a scorching heat wave rocking the western U.S., raising the concerns for more wildfires. But before we head to break, there's an update on the 24-hour change in coronavirus cases across the St. Louis metro. Live from the KMOV Broadcast Center, this is News 4, watching out for you. Welcome back. It's 714. Right now, we are screaming happy birthday to the oldest living person in the United States this morning. The social distancing celebration is for Hester Ford. There she is. She turned 115 or 116 years old yesterday. Her family says census records indicate two different birth dates. Either way, she is the oldest person on record living in the U.S. Ford has 12 children and more than 300 other descendants. She says she doesn't have any really a secret to longevity, but she does eat half a banana every single morning.
Um, I I'm probably if that's good. The I was just gonna say because I'm gonna have to try that. I mean, right? it's I mean it's a healthy item. Why not? Right? Why not? Go for it. Good for her. Oh yeah, it'll be healthy to be outside too this week. Listen, fantastic. <laughs> Usually this time of year, you know, it's so hot, yeah, and steamy, it's like crazy. we had yesterday. Yeah. We had a cold front come through the area last night, and the result, man, the weather. But that's not the case in all parts of the U.S. Much of the western U.S. is oppressive as a summer heat brings waves of record-breaking temperatures. The hot, dry weather is also fueling dozens of wildfires. Don Gabakis has the latest. New this morning, a Japanese tanker off the Mauritius coast breaks in half after leaking tons of oil into the Indian Ocean. The National Crisis Committee of Mauritius said they observed a major detachment at the front of the ship. The ship ran aground southeast of the island on July 25th. Response teams and volunteers have been helping in the oil cleanup operation ever since. According to Greenpeace Africa, the Mauritius government has now decreed that area a forbidden zone. Eight people are being treated at New York hospitals following a house fire in Utica, New York. A spokesperson for the fire department says people there were jumping from second floor windows and neighbors were catching them. Scary. When crews arrived at the scene, they saw heavy smoke and flames coming from the second floor and the fire was spreading to a home nearby. Crews were able to save that home. The cause of the fire is under investigation. And tributes are still pouring in this morning for former Illinois Governor James Thompson. He died yesterday at the age of 84. Thompson, a Republican known as Big Jim, was first elected in 1976 and survived four terms as governor. He'd reportedly been ill for several weeks and died after suffering heart problems. Current Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker released a statement saying Thompson, quote, dedicated himself to building positive change for Illinois, and he set an example for public service of which Illinoisans should be proud of, end quote. And U.S. Senator Dick Durbin says we are political adversaries, yet personal friends back in the day when that was not uncommon. Try as we might, we Democrats just could not beat Big Jim, end quote. Funeral services for former Governor Thompson have not yet been released. And the younger brother of President Donald Trump died yesterday, too. Robert Trump was admitted to a Manhattan hospital Friday with an unspecified illness. A spokesperson says he had had health problems for months. He was 71 years old. The CDC has a warning for parents as the U.S. starts to head back to school. What they're saying about the country's virus caseload. And a local man's dream for culinary school put on hold since the pandemic, but a new partnership is helping him give back in a big way. Stay with us. At 724, you're taking a live look at the north leg of the arch. Sun peaking right there in the middle. It's pretty bright out there. It's going to be a gorgeous day to just be outside. Thanks for joining us again this morning. But many local businesses have been getting creative during this coronavirus pandemic. One example is the North Sarah Food Hub. It was initially founded as a shared kitchen and culinary school, but then COVID-19 hit. News 4's Alyssa Toomey sat down with the founder to talk about how the business is adapting. LeBron Jones still has big dreams. And watching out for your health this morning, a new study finds not all face masks work the same. We'll tell you what you need to know before putting on that mask. Taking a live look down Marcus Street in downtown St. Louis. Gorgeous sun right there. You see the blue skies. Get out and enjoy today. It's going to be nice. We'll be right back. Gunfire in downtown St. Louis Friday night, and residents say it's far too common, and they want something to be done about it. A man who lives in an apartment building along 4th Street in Spruce says the gun violence is becoming a danger to him and his neighbors. You hear those gunshots there. He recorded the cell phone video near his apartment when shots were fired. He says they were fired by people gathering in the Tums parking lot near Broadway and Spruce. The man says he heard at least 50 rounds of gunshots. Goodness, the man who did not want to be identified says every weekend people fill this lot with their motorcycles, dirt bikes and cars. Oftentimes, the man says people ride along the streets shooting guns. For many college students, it's back to school like never before. The coronavirus pandemic is forcing colleges and universities across the country to make major changes. Michael George reports on how students are dealing with the new normal on campus. And News 4 is your back to school authority, and we want to answer your questions about the new school year. Send your questions over to KMOV.com school. 
New this morning, COVID-19 infections among American children account for 7.3% of all of the country's cases. That's according to data released by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The numbers were posted based on data from August 3rd, showing that the number and rate of infections among children in the U.S. saw a steady increase from March to July. However, schools and universities are beginning to reopen despite health concerns. According to Johns Hopkins University, the U.S. had registered over 5 million cases of COVID-19 with over 169,000 deaths. Also new this morning, if getting a nasal swab to test for COVID-19 makes you cringe, here's some good news. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration guaranteed emergency authorization for saliva direct, I got it this time, test yesterday. Researchers from the Yale School of Public Health developed it. It appears to be fairly accurate, cheap, and pretty fast. And the coronavirus is affecting trash in Italy. The country produced 10% less garbage during the coronavirus lockdown. Italian researchers estimate that during the peak months of Italy's lockdown in March and April, urban waste production fell by 500,000 tons. And it's been seven months since the first COVID case was reported in the U.S. And there's still confusion over which protective face masks best prevent the virus from spreading. New guidance recommend that certain face coverings could be less protective than wearing the face mask at all. CBS's Chris Van Cleve has the latest. Coming up on News 4 this morning, some Alabama doctors are looking to make a statement with their scrubs. I'll tell you why. Plus, the end of World War II was 75 years ago when tens of thousands died. Missourians showed their support. We'll show you up next. It's been 75 years since the end of World War II. More than 400,000 Americans lost their lives during the war. That includes around 10,000 Missourians. News Force Caroline Hecker shows us how a group of volunteers honor those heroes for their service and their sacrifice. Get this. Imagine your college acceptance letter being an error. I don't think anyone would like that. The dean of admissions at Syracuse University had to send out correction emails saying just that. The school sent dozens of acceptance messages to the wrong applicants. The emails even contained visa transfer instructions for international students. In the past few years, though, other colleges and universities in Pittsburgh and Florida have made that same mistake. Oh, Yikes. I would not like that. Oh, man. I Eesh. mean, should Eesh. there be some rule if they do that? They have to take it. I them? agree. Come on now. You tell me I got it. I got yeah, in and you then. You can't undo that. Yeah, that I feel bad for those students. Can't renege on that promise. No, no, nope. none of that. Nope, All right. Like hey, it's beautiful out there this morning. Oh, yeah. You feel the difference. I mean, right when you walk out the door, take a look outside. This is if you've been in the hospital, you've seen them, but you probably paid them little to no mind. I'm talking about the scrubs. That's the clothing worn by the workers there in the hospital. Traditionally, the different colors signal someone's job. But in the wake of the pandemic and protests for racial justice, two doctors are changing the dress code. Jesse Mitchell has a story. This is News 4, watching out for you. So we all need to be like this little kid. An ambitious little boy in Louisiana did something many kids do. He started a lemonade stand. But this eight-year-old has taken his business to new heights. Man, don't work, man, don't eat. Stay safe, wash your hands, and then you're good. You be Gucci, man. <laughs> Chase started his lemonade stand two years ago while school was out because of the pandemic. Chase had more time to spend on focusing on his business so now he's serving gallons of his family's secret recipe to customers beyond his neighborhood. Let's hope that Chase can be a role model to anybody who has doubts that they can't make it or they can't succeed in life. I mean, we took just simple old lemonade and we're turning into something bigger. All right, so the little guy uses some of his proceeds for, from his lemonade stand sales to donate gift cards to other kids. He says he hopes to create a nonprofit to continue helping kids in need. Want to guess what today is? It's National Roller Coaster Day. It's the perfect time for thrill seekers like myself to enjoy the excitement that amusement parks have to offer. The unofficial holiday commemorates the first vertical loop roller coaster, which was patented by Edwin Prescott on this day in 1898. The oldest roller coasters are believed to have originated from the so-called Russian mountains built in the 17th century that were made of ice hills and wood. That's interesting. Very I interesting, isn't that it? Before. I haven't either. I'm a roller coaster fan myself. I am too. We need to listen. But yeah. here's the thing, though: when you start getting older, it starts to hurt <laughs> a lot more. So I don't do it as much as I used to. Oh, <laughs> you're youthful. Come on.